Tonight we're going to continue our study of the introduction to biblical theology. And just to remind you one more time of what we're trying to accomplish with biblical theology, we are concerned with what passages or texts contribute to the theme, the primary and dominant theme throughout the scripture, which is the story of Jesus Christ. So in biblical theology, whatever text, whatever passage, whatever book we pull out to study, we are interested to see how it gives us further information about Jesus. And there are a couple of different ways that we go about it. One is to go through the books of the Bible as books or certain sections of the book to see how they prepare for or reveal Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, for instance, we want to study the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus and Leviticus and so on to see how they set the stage for the coming of Christ. And they do so with, through a variety of ways, through events and characters and doctrines and historical narrative to lead us to the cross which came with Jesus Christ. The New Testament books reveal to us the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the person work of Jesus Christ, and teach us how we should respond to the cross. So the Old Testament prepares the way for the coming of Jesus. The New Testament reveals His coming and what that means for us. So one way to do biblical theology is to march through all of the books of the Bible or significant sections. Another way to do it is to trace themes and concepts and words through the scripture and see how they focus on Christ. We did this last time with our look at strangers and exile as we saw how this idea of exile started in the Garden of Eden and continued on through the Old Testament and eventually came to be applied to us as believers in exile living among the Gentiles who are unbelievers. Tonight I want to take another theme and see how it's traced through the Bible. And I want to start by looking at a passage in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, we're in the midst, or actually toward the end of the letters to the seven churches, where Jesus, the risen Lord, is speaking to seven churches in antiquity. And he has some encouraging things to say to some, and some rebuking things to say to others. And beginning in verse 14, we find him writing to the church in Laodicea. And if you're familiar with this passage, you know that he had some pretty strong things to say to this church. They were self-sufficient. They were convinced that in their wealth and in their prosperity, they were pleasing to God. And Jesus has some other things to tell them. So we read in verse 14, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So Jesus here is speaking to this church and saying, you think you're wealthy, you think you're prospering for me, but you are not. You are wretched. You are poor. And he says, you're neither hot nor cold. Now, you may recall, maybe you've been taught that hot there means like on fire for God and cold means you have no concern for God. And Jesus is saying, I would rather you be intentionally cold than lukewarm. But that's not what Jesus is getting at here. Uh, hot springs in antiquity, in Laodicea, had a medicinal quality. Cold springs and cold water uh, quenched thirst. Lukewarm water, which is what they had a lot in Laodicea, was good for nothing. They literally would spit it out of their mouth because it was nasty and did nothing for them. So he's not saying, I would rather you be hot against or, or intense against God. Uh, he's saying, be useful. Do something of real value. Don't be lukewarm and useless. 
Now it's in this rebuke that I want to draw your attention to a phrase that he uses when he says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. And then the next phrase, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Now, if you didn't know anything else about the scripture, you would probably still understand what Jesus was saying. But knowing something about the rest of the Bible, there are two words that should jump out at us that form a theme that is common in the scripture. And they are nakedness and shame. Jesus did not choose that expression, the shame of your nakedness, by accident. Rather, he's drawing on something that occurs repeatedly in the scripture. And I'm sure by now you know where the first occurrence was. Like so many of the themes that we find, it first started in the beginning, in the garden, with Adam and Eve. If you recall, in Genesis chapter 2, God has created man, and then he put this man to sleep and took a rib out and created woman, and he institutes marriage. And he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, thus instituting marriage. And at the end of chapter 2, Moses writes this statement, and they were naked and unashamed. Now, having come right after the context of becoming one flesh, we may think, well, it's talking sexually here, and that would make sense, and indeed he is, but there's more to it than that. He's actually establishing what's going to take place in chapter 3. By describing them as naked and unashamed, he's preparing us for the shame that is to come. At this point, at the end of Genesis 2, Adam and Eve are no different than any of the other creatures that God has made. You ever think about that? We are the only living beings of creation that wear clothes. Well, except for the little poodles and things that you all dress up, and sometimes you see the donkey with the hat and the ears cut out and that kind of thing, and the horses. But we know that no dog went and put a sweater on itself. They're not interested in dressing up. They're not afraid to be naked around people. But we cover ourselves up. That's not the way God originally made us. He made us in what we call our birthday suit. And we were all born in our birthday suit. And we were born naked and unashamed. But something happens as we grow up. There comes a point at which we don't want people to see us without clothes on. Why is that? Well, we get a piece of this in the next chapter. As you know, Adam and Eve sinned against God. They rebelled. They ate of the fruit of the tree that he told them not to. And the first thing they do after they eat of this forbidden fruit is they make for themselves clothing. Then uh, God himself comes walking through the garden as he typically did, and they run and hide. The presumption is they used to run to him when he would join them in the garden. This time, they ran to hide. And God calls out, where are you? And Adam says, we're hiding. He says, why are you hiding? And Adam says, because we are naked. And God says, how did you know you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit that I told you not to eat? There is a direct correlation here between sin and the desire to cover ourselves and to hide from the presence of God and the presence of each other. Adam and Eve put clothes on to protect themselves and to shield themselves from each other. They ran and hid to flee the presence of God. Sin has now caused shame and embarrassment man to man, or in this case man to woman, and man to God. We do not want to be in the presence of other people or in the presence of God because of our sin and our shame. So God calls them on their sin. He curses them. But we find this very important verse, verse 20 of chapter 3. Rather, verse 21. The Lord God 
made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That is crucial for our understanding of everything else that happens in the Bible. God is the one who covered the shame of Adam and Eve. He's the one that made clothes for them. And just in passing, I'll draw your attention again to the fact that they had made clothes out of leaves, plants. God gave them clothes of skin from an animal. This was the first sacrificial lamb who died for the sin of mankind, foreshadowing Jesus Christ who would come later. But I want you to see that God himself is the one who shielded, who covered the sin of Adam and Eve. But this theme continues. You know what happens a little bit later? The world becomes corrupt. God judges mankind with the flood. And all except Noah and his wife and his children, his sons and their wives, all, all of the rest of mankind are killed. So then after the flood, and after the flood resides and, and things get back to normal, in chapter 9 of Genesis, we read starting in verse 20, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. So here is righteous Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a good man, the scripture says. He's the one that God preserved. And after witnessing firsthand the judgment of God on all mankind, he gets drunk as a skunk and naked as a jaybird. And he uncovers himself in his tent, comatose, passed out from all of his imbibing. And one of his sons comes in and sees this, and he goes out to tell his brothers, Hey, Shem, hey, Jephthah, you got to see the old man. He is really laid out in there. This is quite a sight. No concern for the shame and nakedness of his father. In fact, he makes a joke of it. But these other two sons recognize the seriousness of this, and they put a cover on, uh, take a cloth between the two of them, walk in backwards so they can't see him, and they cover the shame and the nakedness of their sinful father. This is the world we live in. We are desperate for somebody to cover our shame. We do not want people to see us physically naked and we don't want people to see us spiritually naked. We are hesitant to open up to other people all that's truly going on in our head and our heart. Just last night, Chris and I had dinner with a couple from the church who will remain nameless, but one of them sitting right over there. And as part of our dinner together, the uh, hostess assigned us uh, the project of bringing some questions to ask the group so that we could have some dialogue. And my wife asked the question, what is something you could have done better today? And I suppose that there were just happened to be four very righteous people yesterday because as we all began to share the things that we could have done better, none of them were very substantial. You know, I could have used my time a little better. You know, I spent about 30 seconds scratching my head and checking a score on email or checking a, a, a sports score, and then I went back to work with my vigorous prayer and fasting and, and Bible study. Of course, that was, you know, what we did the rest of our time yesterday. But as, as we were all going around sharing our relatively tame sins of yesterday, I thought, what if one of us had really done something pretty significant? What if one of us had just flown off the handle at somebody in a fit of rage and let loose with our tongue in a way that we would be extremely embarrassed about? Or what if one of us had, had really let our thoughts go places and our eyes go places they shouldn't have gone? 
Or what if one of us had been so caught up in bitter selfishness that we took something or we lashed out at somebody? Going down the, the list of really significant things, I wonder if any of the four of us would have actually acknowledged that to the rest of the group. That's not something we do very often because we are ashamed. We don't want people to really look inside and see all that is going on. It's easy to sit and share with one another that we're all sinners. We all confess that readily. We know that. I look at you and I know you're a sinner and you look at me and, and you know I'm a sinner. And you've heard me say this before. It is very easy to confess our sin to God and others but it is very difficult to confess our sins to God and to others. To acknowledge we do wrong, no problem. But to say, here are the many things I do wrong, that gets harder, especially as we get beyond the very superficial, well, I was a little lazy, I involved myself in too many hobbies. Those things are, are sort of the respectable sins that Jerry Bridges writes about. But to get into some of the deeper sins, we are not quick to expose those. We don't want to be exposed. We want to be covered. And we are desperate for somebody to cover our shame. It is possible, however, to become so calloused in our shame that we don't feel shame any longer. In other words, the human nature wants to deny this, to defy this, and reach a place where we are not ashamed any longer of our nakedness. The Israelites reached this place, and God called them on it in Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm going to read to you just a couple of verses here at the beginning of Jeremiah 3, where God is using some of the strongest language anywhere to describe the sins of Israel. Here's what God says. If a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not the land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers. Yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see where, you have, been, where have you not been violated. By the roads you have sat for them like an Arab in the desert. And you have polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld and there has been no spring rain. Yet you had a harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. Do you hear what God is saying here to Israel? As he did often in the Old Testament, he compared their idolatry to adultery. And he says, you haven't just committed adultery one time. You haven't just been with one man or even two men. There has hardly a guy between here and New Jersey that you haven't slept with. You have looked for guys under every tree, every path, everywhere. You have been available and revealed yourself and committed adultery with them. And you have become a harlot but you don't know how to be embarrassed anymore. You don't blush at the thought. When somebody sees your harlotry and knows about all of your adulterous affairs, it doesn't bother you. You don't know how to be ashamed. That is a very apt description of the culture in which we live today. This explosion in the last few decades of nudity and shamelessness is a direct defiance of God's statements that we are sinners and should be ashamed. You see, as our culture moves further and further and further away from caring about God and caring about sin, one of the ways it reveals that is to expose ourselves literally in the flesh. I was recently asked to teach a group of single men on pornography, not teach them how to do it, but to discuss the dangers and the sin involved there. And so as I did my research, not looking at the pornography, but finding information about it, I was stunned. Not at the amount of pornography that is out there, and it's a multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry. I wasn't surprised by the people who are making money with this stuff. What shocked me was how many 
amateurs, as they call them, are involved. So many college-aged girls that are having sex with men on film and putting it on the internet, and they're not making a dime off of it. They are completely unashamed. I wonder, 20 or 30 years from now, when they have a husband and children, and this is still out there for people to see, if they will remain as unashamed as they are now. But I was, I was stunned. I guess I was naive to think that this kind of thing was going on. I understand the greed. I understand the pursuit of money and how people would do this for money. But it's just raw, I refuse to be ashamed mentality. That's the culture in which we live. And that's why people are defiant in saying, I'm not going to acknowledge sin. Sin is not a real thing. It's a concoction of religion from our past. There is no sin because there is no creator and there is no law that we are bound to. And therefore, we should just throw off our shackles, throw off our clothes and reveal ourselves. We have nothing to hide. And we see this in other arenas as well. We see this on blogs and um, TV shows, the reality shows where people will get on and acknowledge things that I just scratch my head and think, I can't believe they just said that in front of millions and millions of people. But there's no shame, it seems. There's no concern to guard ourselves. It's all out there. And yet it's not. There are still things that people are hesitant. Even the most obstinate, there are things that people don't want other people to see. Even those who seem to be spouting off in the mouth all the time and taking their clothes off every time the camera's turned on, they want a private life. They want some time away from the world so that people don't see everything. We can pretend and act like we're not accountable for our thoughts, that there's no God watching, that there's no shame to be had, and yet we know that's not true. They know it, and we know it as we try to protect ourselves from each other, as we try to hide our sin and our thoughts from each other, we know there is one being who knows it all. As the Hebrew writer put it in Hebrews chapter 4, there is nothing that is hidden. Chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and naked to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That is a profound statement. The word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword is not the Bible. That's not the point. This is the word of God. If you trace it back earlier in the chapter in context, the word of his judgment. When God comes to call men and women to stand before him at judgment, his word will penetrate to the very core of our being and our mind and our thoughts, and nothing escapes it. He is able to pierce through to the most intimate places. And everything that we do, everything we, that we think, everything that we feel, every motivation of our heart, every word we have ever spoken is laid before Him. And we are completely and utterly naked before the living God. And for anyone who has any sin for which he or she should be ashamed, that is a devastating and terrifying thought that we are completely exposed. There is no hiding. Adam and Eve could not hide from God. We cannot hide from God. Nobody can hide from the all-seeing, all-knowing presence of the living God. And that's why it's such good news that Jesus can say to us and does say to us, you can buy from me white garments that will hide your sin and your shame so that it will not be revealed. That's what he came to do, to suffer on the cross the wrath of God so that when God looks at us, he sees us wrapped in that white garment. 
And now when we stand before God, we are no longer naked. We are covered up with his righteousness and his holiness. And that is what Jesus tells the church at Laodicea to do, to buy this white garment. And that's what he calls us to do, to be clothed and no longer naked and unashamed.